If you are someone who has been following the story of Genshin Impact for any reasonable amount of time over the past few years, then certainly the following thought must have glazed your mind at one point or another. What is Dane Sleeve's element going to be, and just what the heck are these symbols that make up his element supposed to mean? This question is extremely important, because we know for a fact that Dane Sleeve will be playable in the future, even though he does not belong to any of the conventional elements of Teyvat. Obviously, Dainslip isn't alone in this conundrum, as several other potentially playable characters across the story possess powers which extend beyond the currently simplistic system of seven elements. Yet even compared to them, Dainslip's situation is unique, as no one else has this special power that we see in his element, and I reckon most of you have wondered about its implications before. Heck, perhaps you are thinking about it right now. In fact, probably you are. After all, this is the most likely reason you clicked on this video to begin. And don't worry, I won't waste your time because we are going to get into it right off the rip. Only after a very quick disclaimer. The primary purpose behind this video is to function as a follow-up to a previous lore theory that I made regarding the Descenders and the Evolved Dragons of Natlan. But don't worry, you won't need to watch that previous theory to understand this one, because look, I'm gonna be honest with you. That video is over half an hour long and I'm not under some kind of delusion where I expect someone to have 31 minutes of their day to spare watching a video game theory just so that they can watch yet another long ass lore video. People have jobs and families to attend to and I can understand that. However, the reason I am emphasizing my previous point is because it is crucial to understand that many of the topics which I'll be discussing here are in the context of the conclusions that I reached previously. So if you hear me saying something that sounds insane, then please understand that it has probably been explained in detail before. Now, of course you might be wondering, just how crazy could it be? Well, to give you an idea, Klee, Layla, Pulcinella, and Iansan are dragons while Dan Sleep is the third descender. Yeah, I was not joking when I said it's crazy. Before I unravel the mystery behind Dane's element, let me briefly bring you up to speed so that we are all on the same page here. Okay. So Dane Sleep is the mortal remains of the Third Descender, also known as the Prince of Light who is mentioned in the Gnostic Chorus of the Battle Pass. The Prince of Light also happens to be the Traveler from Afar who is mentioned in the records of Dreyun during the Age of the Seelies before the Calamity of the Moon Sisters. This makes his wife, the Seely Royalty, mentioned in the same sources, whom I HIGHLY suspect to be the Princess of the Moonlight Forest from the Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies, which in turn is inspired by Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You know it. That story with the princess, the dwarves, the prince, the evil queen, and the magical mirror on the wall. Yeah, keep it in mind, who knows, it might prove to be useful later in the video. Celestia, on the other hand, is ruled by two figures, the Night Mother, who is the second descender and the first heir of the Kingdom of Heaven, who was sent to retrieve the Genesis Pearl, and the Primordial One, who is likely the first descender and the serpent holding the Genesis Pearl. Here, we encounter a juncture in the narrative where information becomes notably vague and scarce. Nevertheless, it is established that 30 days after the third descender married the Seelie royalty, a great calamity ensued, resulting in the Moon Sisters killing each other. At this point, the first and second descenders turn against the third, severing his divinity from his body akin to Fosalor's separation of her divinity to create Farina. They then extract the seven Gnosis from it, leaving behind only his mortal vessel, which was later discarded into a tree. And that happens to be Dainslip. Once again, this was just a quick recap, I've already gone over this in detail in my previous video. Now, I am sure many of you might be wondering where I got this idea that Dainsleaf was seated into a tree. Uh, look, I won't lie to you, I cannot tell you where I got this idea, and unfortunately I probably won't be able to tell you for a few more years. Even so, what I can tell you is that Dainsleaf is called the Bowkeeper, and that title alone is enough for me to speculate on something. Keep it in mind, I'll get to it by the end of this video. Great. Now that we, hopefully, have established common grounds on the subject matter, let us not waste any more time. What is Dainsleaf's element? Well, first of all, I am not sure if we can call it an element, because looking at the type of power he wields, it is not clear to me whether it really meets the criteria for a quote-unquote element, but for the sake of simplicity, let's just call it an element in this video. In order to properly understand what we are looking at right here, we are going to have to systematically break down the symbol of Dane's element into its various components and look at them through different lenses, starting with a method that I have used previously in this video behind me right now. However, this time, I have a much clearer picture to paint. If you take a closer look at Dane's element, you will notice that it can be divided into seven semi-equivalent parallel segments, each displaying a different symbol. Now, at first glance, these symbols appear like they are random gibberish with no real meaning behind them. And for the most part, that is true, it is random gibberish. But like I said, for the most part. 
Once again, keep this in mind, I'll get to it in a couple of minutes, and even if you think that you know where I'm going, I promise you, you don't. During my initial analysis of Dane's element, I stated that these seven symbols correspond to the seven elements of Teyvat, those being Pyro, Hydro, Enemo, Electro, Dendro, Cryo, and Geo in their most primitive basic state as they are found in the Abyss, which I equated to the Sea of Quanta. However, following the lore bomb we got from Skirk during Masquerade of the Guilty, we now have a profoundly more sophisticated idea of what's going on. You see, Nubilat tells the Traveler that the seven Gnosis were carved out of the remains of the Third Descender by the Second and First Descenders, and when we put this information into perspective, with everything else we know, it becomes clear that the Third Descender is the Prince of Light shown at the end of the Gnostic Chorus, and who also happens to be the Traveler from afar who married the Sealy Royalty in the Lunar Palace of the Moon Sisters. Fearing his ascension to Godhood and the rise of a new order, the Night Mother and the Primordial One turned on him and ripped his divinity from his body, leaving the behind only a mortal shell, much like how Fothalor split her own divinity leaving behind Furina. Celestia then tore the Third Descender's divinity into seven fragments and used them to instigate the Arkan War. While the Third Descender's mortal remains, with his power exhausted and his memories wiped out, was discarded into the hollow of a tree, where it was later found by a one-eyed sage seeking wisdom to create a kingdom without God. The sage then named him the Twilight Sword. Now, if you think that what I'm saying is mere fanfiction, then let me stop you right here. Because the Twilight Sword's name, Daneslif, is an old Nordic name that can be separated into two parts. Dane, which means dead, and Sleif, which means legacy. Therefore, combined, the name Daneslif can be interpreted as the dead man's legacy. In other words, the seven unknown symbols that make up Dane's element are in reality the defiled remains of the seven elements that were ripped out of him by the usurpers when his divinity, his legacy, was carved out of him, leaving behind a hollowed husk of what was once the Prince of Light. And if you carve out someone's self and memories, you will be left only with the abyss. But like always, you know what, at this point you guys know the catchphrase for this channel. There is more to it. Because of course there is more to it. Better yet, you know the more to it which I'll talk about right now? Yeah, there is gonna be even more to that once we are done later. This is how deep this shit goes. Yeah, I should probably just embrace the memo and accept the fact that there is just always more to it. But on a more serious note, I know that I can sometimes be overthinking things, however, it is seriously impressive how intricate Genshin Impact's story is to even facilitate such kinds of discussions to begin with. Holy vs. writers crafted a truly amazing fantasy world that will live on for a very long time, especially once the anime comes out. At any rate, I am still far from done with Dane's element, so let's get on with it. Remember that Genshin's core universe is based upon Gnosticism. After all, you need look no further than the name of the primary motivation behind this video, the Gnostic Chorus of the Battle Pass where the Genesis Pearl is found. Historically, one of the most widely used languages to record Gnostic texts has been the Coptic script. Alright, buckle up, we've just hit the pinnacle of complexity and importance in this video. I will do my utmost to break it down clearly. The Coptic script is a writing system that developed during the 3rd and 4th centuries AD in Northern Egypt. It combines Greek alphabets augmented by ancient Egyptian characters, forming the basis for the now extinct Coptic language, a descendant of the ancient Egyptian language. What I just said is extremely relevant for two major reasons. The first conveniently brings us back to the origins of Genshin Impact's Gnostic Chorus. The story itself is inspired by a Syriac poem called Hind of the Pearl, where the King of Kings sends his second heir to retrieve the Genesis Pearl from a serpent in Egypt. The boy is later seduced by the Egyptians and forgets that he is the son of kings, until he receives a letter from his parents to remind him of his true identity and mission. In Genshin, this letter takes the form of the two stars which were captured by the world's gravity, which means yes, Aether and Lumine are a piece of paper. On the other hand, the second reason has to do with the Coptic script itself. As I mentioned earlier, a considerable chunk of Gnosticism is written in the Coptic language, and going back to the symbols of Dainsleif's element, I also said earlier that they consist of a set of characters which seemingly belong to no language, but seemingly is the keyword here, because that's not really true. To illustrate what I mean, let us pull up the Coptic alphabet I've been talking about for a moment. If you take a look at the archaic forms of the Coptic script, three suspiciously familiar letters should stand out in your eyes, those being Hori, Kappa, and Sampi in both of its uppercase and lowercase forms. 
Oh look! How convenient is it that these letters fit perfectly into the seemingly random gibberish of Dainsleaf's element, and once we translate them into their appropriate pronunciations, we get... we get... absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's actually still random gibberish. You see, the three aforementioned letters can be roughly vocalized as H, K, and a very heavy S or T sound in English. And my most generous attempt at pronouncing that is the... Uh, which, uh, look, not sure if this has any hidden meaning in some obscure language. If you do, then let me know down in the comments, I guess. But as far as I'm concerned, these letters have no meaning whatsoever, which means we hit a roadblock. <laughs> roadblock. Right. If you thought I was going to give up here, then you don't know me very well. Follow along. You'll see. In the prequel video to this one, I spent a great deal of time emphasizing the importance of snakes as a symbol across human civilizations and in Genshin Impact, with the primordial one being depicted as a black serpent in the Gnostic Chorus. And as I said before, snakes are just a dog shit version of a dragon. Conveniently, Dainsleaf's constellation happens to be Ouroboros, which is a symbol of Egyptian origins depicting a serpent or a dragon eating its own tail. And I hope that everything I have said so far regarding the Coptic language and Hymn of the Pearl has established just how important Egypt is to Genshin Impact's core universe. At any rate, since Dainsleaf is from Conria, which is a nation heavily inspired by Norse mythology, it makes perfect sense for his constellation Ouroboros to be equated with Jormungandr, the serpent of Midgard that will bring about Ragnarok, the end of the world, which in turn perfectly matches the characteristics of the Descenders, whose arrival is set to bring about the end of an era and the rise of a new one. This cycle of creation and destruction is described by Jacob's nurse Synchroids Ordo, who noted down four eras, each coinciding with one of the four descenders, which they personally named as the Hyperborea, Natlantine, Remuria, and Crown Arya. Now, Hoyoverse are well known for taking considerable amounts of inspiration from Hinduism in their games, and the concept of a cycle of destruction and creation is extremely prominent in Hinduism where it is tied to the belief in an eternal cyclical nature of the universe. This cycle is known as a samsara, which encompasses the continuous process of birth, death, and rebirth, and is represented by the three principal deities in Hinduism, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. While all three of them are important, Vishnu is the one who pertains to the topic of discussion the most, as he is a well-known god of snakes and is symbolized by the divine serpents. With that being said, the Samsara cycles are not the only relevant piece of information we've obtained from the Northern Kroiz Ordo, because at the top of the Tower of Gestalt, the Traveler comes across a note written by René de Petricor, where he states that a Descender is one who possesses a will powerful enough to protect, sustain, destroy, and create the world. Here, I'm going to quickly bring your attention to the opening line of the note, which reads, Iyo Iyo Pan, that which lies beneath the Great Sea. The first part of this line originates from a poem written by John Keats, titled Endymion. First published in 1818, the poem is named after the Greek mythological figure Endymion, a handsome shepherd loved by the moon goddess Selene. And as I mentioned at the start, the third descender is all but confirmed to be the traveler from afar who fell in love with the Sealy royalty, with their wedding taking place at the lunar palace under the watchful eyes of the moon sisters. This is very important because it establishes the third descender as a potential subject of the note. Moving on to the next part, that which lies beneath the Great Sea, René says that it comes from a Sumerian text where it is read as Narayana, and Narayana happens to be one of the avatars of the Hindu god of time and preservation, Vishnu who, as I said earlier, is heavily associated with snakes. In fact, Narayana happens to depict Vishnu resting on a serpent called Adishesha, with his consort Lakshmi by his side. But let us focus on Adishesha for a moment. He is known as the King of Serpents, and his name Shesha means he who remains. This refers to the fact that Vishnu sleeps on him, and his awakening for the next cycle of creation heralds the destruction of all things. Uh, so, the world serpents Shesha and Jormungandr are cool and all, and yeah, sure, there is the connection with Dainsleaf's constellation Ouroboros, but honestly, who cares? This video isn't about snakes, it's about Dainsleaf's element and what it means. Well, there happens to be one more substantial detail that I've been holding off on you. 
let us go back to the Coptic alphabet. Taking another look at the letter Sampi, we know that Dale Slave's element uses it twice in both of its uppercase and lowercase formats. But what I didn't tell you is that the capital Sampi can also be written as such, where it very closely resembles the English letter A. Knowing this, we can go back to the Coptic symbols in Dale Slave's element and replace the old capital Sampi with this one, which gives us absolutely nothing. Yet again, we are left with random gibberish, and here, I give up. It's all pointless. Dude, it doesn't matter how far I look and how much I try, I just can't make it make sense. Honestly, what am I doing? People clicked on this video expecting a high-quality analysis of Dale Slave's element, and here I am wasting their time confusing them by rambling on and on and on about princesses and snakes and Egypt out of all places. But in the end, I can't come up with even half a logical answer to my own theory. Lambad, give me the strongest damn thing you've got. Uh... Perhaps I'm not good enough. Perhaps I'm not cut out for this. I just don't have it in me. Don't got what it takes to make it work. Man, now I won't even get to tell them my theory on why Densley was thrown into a tree along with the implications this has on Boer. Eh, who cares? Whatever. I'm just gonna walk under the moonlight and wallow in my own misery. Ah, uh, the moon is beautiful tonight. Come to think of it, Nahida said that she is just the moon. The real sun is long gone. <laughs> How ironic. What a fitting analogy for my end. Just like the moon, I can only but muster an imitation and reflect the true light of the sun, never hoping to reach the glory of a star. But if Nahida is the moon, that makes her a mirror. Does that mean the false sky is some sort of wall? Hmm. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all. Hold on a second. Wait. Wait. Wait the fuck up, samurai. Get those damn symbols back. We've got a night mother to burn. Even with the modified capital Sampi, the current iteration of the Coptic script on Dave Sleep's element still does not make sense. However, remember what I told you at the start of this video. When the Night Mother and the King captured the Prince of Light, they cursed both him and his wife, the Seelie royalty, by wiping out their memories and then separating them. While the Third Descender's divinity was ripped out of him and broken into various fragments, leaving behind the mortal Dane Slip. And like I said, when you carve out someone's memories and will, you are left with nothing but the Abyss. This is very interesting because Jacob Baker and René de Petricor created a pocket dimension where they housed the will of their friend Carter, which takes the shape of a dog in Canotilla's quest. And one of the ways through which we can access that realm is literally through the looking glass, as in Alice through the looking glass. Since Jacob's dream realm is an abyss-like realm, this sets a precedent for the abyss to be some sort of a twisted reflection of Teyvat, with the moon being the mirror. And this has all sorts of implications on Ryan Daughter's work, but that's a topic for another time. What I care about now is the sort of implications it has on my work at hand. And oh, mamma mia, it's a spicy dish. While the current arrangements of letters across Dainsleaf's element does not mean anything, if we take the first Hori and Sampi letters and reflect them, then go ahead and rotate the kappa in the middle by 90 degrees, we now have a series of letters that resemble something comprehensible. That is, Thesa. Oh, look at these conveniently placed dots right around the two S's. How about we highlight those as well? Which now gives us, that's right, the King of Serpents, Shesha, Vishnu's Adishesha Narayana. A will powerful enough to create, protect, sustain, and destroy the world. The Twilight Sword of Kandria 
is the third descender. And like I said before, this is not a theory, this is not a prediction, this is a spoiler. But we still don't have a complete picture yet. And to wrap things off, let me give you some final food for thought. You see, I have been talking this whole time about Dane Slate being thrown into a tree, but I never actually elaborated on why that is the case. Well, first things first, let us start by identifying the tree. It's Erminsel. I think that much is blatantly clear to everyone. After all, Erminsul is a ley line tree and directly inspired by the world tree Yggdrasil from Norse mythology. Since Deepseef's constellation is Ouroboros, which is a serpent or a dragon eating its tail as a representation of the cyclical nature of life, death, and rebirth, then equating him with Jormungandr is a no-brainer. And funny enough, based on the Hymn of the Pearl, we know that the second and the third descenders in the Gnostic chorus are siblings. Well, the older sibling was deceived by the primordial one in her quest to retrieve the Genesis Pearl, and became the Night Mother, Queen of the Kingdom of Darkness. Now, this Kingdom of Darkness is clearly Tevat, and Tevat can actually be easily equated with Hell. All the gods are named after demons, the Night Mother is called the Mother of Sin, and the world is enveloped by a barrier designed to block out the heavens, both literally and figuratively. This is perfect, because Jormungandr in Norse mythology, just like the Third Descender, also happens to have a sister, who is conveniently called Hell. At any rate, I'm gonna cut out the chase and keep it short and simple. What I'm trying to get at is that Jormungandr is not the only serpent representing the cyclical nature of life and death and rebirth in Norse mythology. I am sure many of you have heard of Nidhogg, which is a serpent, or a dragon, that dwells near the well of Gvergelmir gnawing at the roots of Yggdrasil. This is likely the primordial one by my current assessment. The explanation for that is a whole different can of forms that we'll talk about in a future video. But Nidhogg could also be Dane's thief. Let me tell you why. Dane's title is the Bow Keeper, and it goes without saying that the Bow in his title is the main branch of Ermansul, which leads us back to none other than the God of Preservation, Vishnu. Here, I will admit that what I'm about to say will be a little bit of a stretch, but hear me out. Across this video, I discussed Narayana, the avatar of Vishnu in the context of Vishnu and Shesha, but those two alone don't paint a complete picture. In Hinduism, Narayana depicts Vishnu resting on the serpent king Shesha, with his wife Lakshmi by his side massaging his feet. But who would be Lakshmi's counterpart in Genshin? An obvious first answer would be the silly royalty that married the traveler from afar, but I am inclined to disagree. Here is why. Dainsleaf is the bow keeper, and the bow of Ermansul can be interpreted as Gungnir, the spear which Odin stabbed himself with to obtain wisdom. Keyword wisdom. In Genshin, Odin's obvious counterpart is the Kondrian legendary king Ermin, who, like I said earlier, likely found Dainsleaf in Ermansul. Now, Lakshmi in Hinduism is dubbed as the goddess of Maya which has many meanings in Hinduism, but can be boiled down to the cosmic illusion that veils the true reality. Sounds a lot like Ermansul if you ask me. Ah, well lo and behold, turns out that our favorite Radish's elemental birth is called the Shrine of Maya, meaning that the final missing piece to the puzzle of Narayana is the avatar of Ermansul herself, Boar. As the third descender, Dane would possess tremendous knowledge and foresight into the inner workings of the world tree and the false sky, which explains why he is the one who narrates the collected miscellanies of every character in Tevat, bar a few exceptions done by Alice. Dane provides detailed insights into their lives, ambitions, and even goes so far as to comment his opinion on their entire existence, which is a really weird thing for a human to say. Exactly why I say he is no human, no god, but rather a being that transcends the world itself. A descender from the kingdom established amongst the heavens. So, don't you think that it's interesting that Dainsleif is collecting fairy tales? After all, Nahida is the fairy of the tree, and Genshin Impact itself functions like an extended series of fairy tales. Thus, I find myself wondering, for what purpose is he collecting them? Although Dainsleaf is clearly in opposition to Celestia, the longer the story goes on, the more I am starting to believe in the Abyss sibling. We cannot trust this man. Oh, and by the way, the Pale Princess, the Seelie ancestor who married the Outlander, it's most likely Paimon. 
Which means, yes, the Traveler is actively fucking Dane Sleep across every moment of the story. Regardless, I am sure many of you have a lot of questions. Like, what about the Travelers? What about Rhine Daughter? And what about Sir Taloji the Fowl? And most importantly, what about the Night Mother? Well, what if I told you that the answer to the Night Mother is hidden in Taya? And that answer is... Gonna have to wait until another time, because for now, we have reached the end of this video. So, thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you very soon in the next time. And for the love of God, I no longer trust anyone on Teva, just give me Lumine, give me my sister, and let me leave this crazy planet. Goodbye.